Hello, and welcome to Now Where Were We? A series of short videos about the history of Olympia, Lacey, and surrounding areas. Your host for this program is Deborah Ross. In this series, Deb takes us to locations that inform us about the history of our community. She also visits with local historians. We welcome your feedback and suggestions. Hello and welcome to Now Where Were We, an ongoing series of short videos about the history of Olympia, Lacey, and surrounding areas. I'm Deborah Ross. And this is the third episode in our series that we're calling By the Decades. Each episode is featuring a different decade in our area's history. Today we're up to the 1860s and I'm standing on a bluff overlooking Capitol Lake near downtown Olympia. Capitol Lake was once the Deschutes Estuary, a broad estuary leading out from the Deschutes River into Bud Inlet. And in those days, in the late 1850s, James Tilton, an early surveyor, made his home here. In 1860, a young boy named Charlie Mitchell, living in the Tilton household, set in motion a series of events that ended up in an international incident. To learn more about Charlie's story and about James Tilton, I traveled to Tacoma to meet with historian Lorraine McConaughey, who discovered the story in old newspapers of the time. Her book, Free Boy, tells the story of Charlie, James Tilton, and the events that occurred in the 1860s that led to the Charlie Mitchell episode. Well, I'm here in the reading room of the Research Center of the Washington State Historical Society in Tacoma, and I'm meeting with public historian Lorraine McConaughey, who discovered the story of Charles Mitchell and James Tilton. And thank you so much for coming down here to share that story with us, Lorraine. Thank you for inviting me. Well, let's start with uh, James Tilton how he came to Olympia and his role in Washington Territory when he arrived. Tilton came from a very well-to-do family, indeed a family that combined the Gibsons and the Tiltons, and that combination becomes important as we learn about Charles Mitchell. But Tilton and his family moved to Indiana, and he became a surveyor, studied as a boy in his teens, and became quite expert at that trade. He was also, after the war with Mexico, a war hero and became very prominent in the Democratic Party in Indiana. He worked very hard for the election of Franklin Pierce to the presidency, and since Washington Territory was brand new in 1853, the sitting president and members of his cabinet in Washington, D.C. governed the territory. They appointed every significant office here. So James Tilton was rewarded for his political fealty uh, um, by being appointed Surveyor General in Washington Territory. He arrived in 1855. His wife, his kids, and Charles Mitchell came to join him in Olympia in the spring of 1855. And uh, do we know where he lived in Olympia? Yes, I believe we do. Um, a house up on the hillside. I think there are a couple of photographs of it. It was a very gracious residence. Really, there were very few jobs in Washington Territory that paid a salary. Um, it, really, barter was the order of the day. Most people were cleaned out of cash by the time they got here. But if you were on the federal payroll, you were doing very, very well. The Tilton home was, a no, was known for um, entertainment. We find that Captain Fleming, um, who was the master of the Eliza Anderson, the international mail steamer, often had dinner at the Tilton home. It was a very lively political and social place. Let's just talk about how you discovered that story, and then you can go on into telling our story. And while you do, um, we are going to be showing some images from an exhibit that was uh, mounted by the Museum of History and Industry in Seattle that recounted the story of the Charles Mitchell episode, and you were the curator for that 
exhibit? Um, I was the historian, public historian at the Museum of History and Industry. We had a traveling show coming from back east that was all about the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln's role in decision making. My job was to root it in the local story. I had been taught all my life coming up that there was no story to learn about the Civil War in Washington Territory, that people came here to find gold and plant orchards, and 10 minutes of reflection will tell you that's absurd. People bring their ideas with them wherever they go, just like they bring a Bible or garden seeds or what have you. So I went to the newspapers, the Pioneer and Democrats, you know, the Olympia newspaper, thinking, well, People here couldn't vote for the presidency. We were a territory. But surely they would have been interested in this very complicated election of 1860. The two wings of the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and the Union Party, four candidates. And of course, whoever won would in effect govern Washington territory. So I was reading the newspaper on microfilm, jotting down notes about you know, the editorials and the Pioneer and Democrat. And I saw a headline over to the right tiny headline, and it was Fugitive Slave Case. And I thought, oh, how interesting. I'm sure that's about Cincinnati. But it wasn't. It was about Olympia. And it was about the escape of Charles Mitchell from James Tilton's household on September 26, 1860, on the Eliza Anderson. Um, and it, it is a, a nice long story. The way that Charles Mitchell got here in the first place was the intertwined families of Gibson and Mitchell. Charles Mitchell was given to James Tilton and his wife as a wedding gift from the Gibson plantation. And it is very, very difficult to trace slaves by name until after emancipation because they're simply check marks in a box of gender and age um, in the slave census of that plantation. But we believe, Judy Bentley and I believe, that Charles Mitchell was born in 1847. He was three years of age when his mother died in the great cholera epidemic of 1850. Um, shortly after that, Charles Mitchell was given to the, to the Tiltons as a wedding gift and came to Olympia with the family. So, uh, Lorraine, what was his role in the Tilton household, as far as you know? As far as we know, that's a very important phrase. Um, people didn't write a great deal about Charles Mitchell. We know that he was present in the home. We believe that he served at dinner, because that's the way Captain Fleming on the Eliza Anderson remembered him and recognized him when he had stowed away on the boat. He was a boy. He, when he fled, he was 12 or 13 in 1860. So what could a boy do who was a slave? And Tilton was intending to train him as a steward to cook on a steamer in Puget Sound. He was going to school, Mitchell. He was going to church. And he was going to be trained. Tilton seems to have expected that Washington Territory would remain free territory, regardless of what happened um, elsewhere. In fact, James Tilton was considered something of a model of racial behavior. George Pickett named his son, James Tilton Pickett, to, to honor um, James Tilton. And James Tilton Pickett was, of course, an interracial boy, um, half native and, and half Virginian. And when George Pickett went uh, south back to Virginia during secession winter, he left his son behind and he left James Tilton, our James Tilton, in charge financially of the boy's well-being. And James Tilton Pickett then becoming a famous artist later on in, in his adulthood. Yes, becoming an artist, struggling a bit. I'm not sure famous is quite the word I would use. Um, we, we think much more of him now than he was thought of at the time. He died of tuberculosis very early, what, 28, 32, something of that sort. Um, so many very sad lives of these mixed descendancy people. So let's go on with the story about uh, Charlie or Charles Mitchell and, and what happened to him to create this international incident. Charlie Mitchell was approached at least two times in the marketplace in Olympia by African Americans and African Canadians whose names we know. James Allen was the steward on board the Eliza Anderson. And he said to Charlie, do you even know you are a slave? 
it was a town with very few people of color, the Rebecca, Rebecca Howard and her husband, um, uh, but out in the countryside, a very few more. Did Charles Mitchell even realize he was a slave, and would he run away from this white family, stow away on the Eliza Anderson, Alan promised to hide him in the pantry down in the galley, and he mustn't get out in Seattle, mustn't get out in Stillicum. In Victoria, he could get out and he would be free, and he could join a free black community that would raise him and love him. And Victoria at that time was nearly 25% black. There was a huge migration, out migration, of African Americans from California in particular to Victoria, up to the Fraser River Gold Rush and then back to Victoria. So there's a very, it's a large black community. Charles Mitchell was difficult to convince, but eventually he was convinced. And he slipped down to the landing in Olympia at dawn at dawn on the 26th of September, 1860, to take this incredible risk um, and, and stow away on a boat for a life he could not know. There was no telegraph. The newspaper was the only source of information at that time. You couldn't look up on Google, what's Victoria? What's, well, you know, what is going to happen to me? It was a remarkably brave thing to do, I think. We don't know what went on in Charles Mitchell's head. No one really does. But he did make the choice that he made, and he was discovered on the boat by the captain. Uh, Woodbury Doan was the sort of the second officer on the ship. Uh, um, Charles Fleming was the captain of the ship, and they discovered him in Seattle. Um, and the captain said, Ike Fleming, I remember you. I saw you at James Tilton's home and you're gonna work your way to Victoria, you're gonna shovel coal, and then I'm gonna take you back to your master. Um, and master is the noun that's used. So the ship arrives in Victoria, the dock is lined with um, members of the black community there, and what are called by the Olympia pioneer and Democrat humanitarians. One of the members of the crowd was a white attorney who gained a writ of habeas corpus to push against the captain's imprisonment of Charles Mitchell on board the ship. The captain said, I'm taking you back to your master in Olympia. You're not getting out on this dock. But a writ of habeas corpus was served by the sheriff in Victoria who, who brought Charlie into the prison overnight. He was freed the next morning. And then what became of him? Yes, what did become of him? <laughs> Well, you know, we said that Charles Mitchell is a, is a very difficult person to research compared with James Tilton. There are no images of Charles Mitchell. There are images of James Tilton. There's a very strong archival record for Tilton. Finding Charles Mitchell is genealogical research. So you're thinking, all right, he was born in 1847, so he's three in 1850, 13 in 1860, 23, 33, 43, and you go through the federal censuses in the United States for boys and young men of color um, every 10 years in the decennial census, and the same in Canada. Well, there were two and a half dozen young men and boys of the right age who were listed as black or mulatto. Which one is our Charles Mitchell? So we ended our biography with our best guess. Since the book has been published, um, more information has come to light. I think it's still not crystal clear um, which Charles Mitchell is our Charles Mitchell. Did he die in Sioux Harbor? Did he go on to California and live out a long, long life? It's very hard to tell. We don't know for certain, but we know he gained his freedom. We have a glimpse of him in school. There were, there were some sisters who oh, were from Great Britain and they were traveling throughout the Wild West. And they went to Victoria and they saw Charles Mitchell in school. He was in the Boys Collegiate Preparatory Academy there. Um, and you know, we know, therefore, that he was literate. We know that he was going to school here in Olympia. So he was well educated. And then what became of him, to me, the uncertainty is pleasing. Um, to me, it, it, is a good, it is a good emblem of the archival elitism that makes it so, so difficult to trace a person, an ordinary person living in everyday life, may not necessarily have anything to do with color. How would you find out about your great, great grandmother? This is very difficult. But people of prominence, archives collect their stuff.
So what, what did happen then with James Tilton that we do know a lot about? Well, James Tilton, um, James Tilton was a Democrat. He was a man of his party. He was a man of his time. He was deeply angered by Charles Mitchell's flight, and it hardened his racial perceptions. So we find a number of glimpses of James Tilton during the Civil War. He didn't leave. He lost his job to a Republican, so you have this dramatic transferal of power from the Democrats, and a Republican uh, takes um, James Tilton's job. But he didn't go south. He stayed in place. A number of appointees of the Pierce and Buchanan administrations did go south. Um, and then there were constant rumors of a, a paramilitary pro-Confederate militia called the Knights of the Golden Circle that remained here in Washington Territory during the war in Oregon, in California, intending to secede the territories and states into the Confederacy. It was often rumored that James Tilton was a member of the Knights of the Golden Circle. He um, is remembered by a couple of fellow drinkers uh, going to Praise Saloon in Olympia and having too much brandy and talking about how the South was within their rights to secede, that secession was uh, a right under the Constitution and that Lincoln had no right to try to force uh, the Confederacy to, to return. He ran for de delegate of the territory in 1865, and he ran on a frankly racist platform. Um, the the platform made clear this is a white man's country. Indians, women, people of color, Chinese have no rights as citizens and no rights to vote. As Tilton announced his candidacy in Olympia, the telegraph was only two years old, and the news came over the telegraph that Lincoln had died, that he had been assassinated. So as Tilton's candidacy was announced to this glorious music, band music, the music changed to a dirge, and he lost that election by a landslide. He left right after that. Um, in 1865, he took his wife and his family and they went back east. And he was a surveyor. He was you know, a very, very skillful professional. But he comes back to Washington Territory uh, to survey the Northern Pacific Line and to lay out Tacoma, the town in which we're recording this interview today. So James Tilton has a huge role in Washington Territory and then Washington State. Lorraine, thank you so much for coming here to Tacoma and for us uh, being able to uh, record here at the Washington State Historical Society's Research Center and uh, not Olympia's most glorious shining moment in our history, but one that I think we really need to understand and recognize and, and uh, learn from. So thanks again, Lorraine, for You're for very here. welcome. And I should say, you know, Olympia was not entirely an anti-union town. There's a wonderful record of a 4th of July picnic in 1861 where, you know, it's a potluck. Everybody cooks and bakes, and someone had made a cake. And on top of the cake was a Confederate flag, and it was surrounded with hemlock. So the poison. The poison. So this baker was very, very strongly pro-union. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you.